Greetings students and welcome to my very first video on real analysis. My series on complex variables has gotten quite popular so far, but I thought that keeping it real is all the rage with the kids these days, so that's why I've shifted focus to real analysis. One of the first questions that might come to your mind is, what is real analysis? Well, real analysis is the study of real numbers, real sequences, real series, and real functions. A lot of real analysis is focused on developing single variable calculus, especially in the first few courses. So if you've gone through a single variable calculus sequence, which most of you might have already gone through, the start of this series can get a bit tedious. In fact, when we start real analysis in these first few videos, we'll be starting from some really basic stuff. For instance, in this lesson, we're going to talk about sets. A set is just a collection of objects, and those objects could be anything. I could have a set S1 for the days of the week from Monday to Sunday. I could have another set S2 for the first five natural numbers. I could have a set S3 with a bunch of random elements. And I could also have an infinite set of all the natural numbers. Keep in mind that the elements of a set are allowed to be anything. There's hardly any restriction on what you can have in there. You can have a set like 3, 5 that's within a larger set. You can also have an infinite set like the set of natural numbers here. So even sets within sets and infinite sets are allowed. Now what can I say about the element 2 in relation to these four sets that I've created? Well, I can say that 2 belongs to the set S2 and to the set N. This backwards 3 symbol means that 2 is in S2 and N, or 2 belongs to S2 and N. 2 is found in those two sets. I can also say that 2 is not found in the sets S1 and S3, or that 2 does not belong to S1 and S3. This is denoted by the belongs to symbol, but with a line running across it. And in general, if an element x is found in a set s, we write x belongs to s, and if it's not found in the set s, we write x does not belong to the set s. Let's create another set s4, containing just the two weekend days, Saturday and Sunday. Coincidentally, Saturday and Sunday are also found in the set s1, the set of days of the week. As a result, we would say that s4 is a subset of s1, or that s1 is a superset of s4. In general, a set A is a subset of a set B if every element X that belongs to A also belongs to B. Now in addition to saying that S4 is a subset of S1, we can also say that S4 is a proper subset of S1. In general, a set A is a proper subset of set B if all the elements in A belong to B, and if B contains elements that do not belong to A. Essentially, a proper subset is like a subset, except one of the sets has to be bigger than the other. In the case of S4, all the elements in S4, the Saturday and Sunday, are also found in the set S1. However, the set S1 also contains five additional elements for the weekdays, which aren't found in S4. That's why it would be correct to say that S4 is also a proper subset of S1. And finally, what if I made a set S5 consisting of the natural numbers from 1 to 5? Well, in that case, we can say that S5 is a subset of S2 because all the elements in S5 are found in S2. But then we can also say that S2 is a subset of S5 because, again, all the elements in S2 are found in S5. As a result, we would say that S2 and S5 are equal to each other because they contain the exact same elements. Just to define the idea of set equality, two sets are equal if they contain the exact same elements, and another way to define this is that if A is a subset of B and B is also a subset of A, then A and B are equal. In fact, this is often how we prove in theorems that two sets are equal by showing that they're subsets of each other. Just going back, I'm going to give some intuition behind the subset and proper subset notation. This subset notation looks like a less than or equal to sign, except it's rounded. And this makes sense, because subsets are allowed to equal each other. However, the notation for a proper subset looks like a less than sign, which also makes sense because a proper subset is smaller than the actual superset. There can't be an equality if proper subsets are involved. 
So, so far we've defined sets by listing all their elements, but just as an aside, we can also define them by using a mathematical statement. For instance, the set S consists of all elements X such that a statement P of X is true. For example, we could say that the set S6 consists of all X such that X is a natural number and X is greater than 2. This would obviously mean that the set consists of the elements 3, 4, 5, and so on. You get the idea. This statement method is just another way we can define sets. By the way, this colon after x in the statement method of defining a set means such that. Now let's talk about some set operations like union, intersection, and complement, starting with the union. The union of two sets a and b, denoted by a union b, is defined as the set of elements x such that x is either in a or in b. Note that here I've used the statement method just mentioned to define A union B. And just to give some intuition behind the union, if I drew the sets A and B in a Venn diagram, where all the elements in set A were inside the circle denoting set A, and all the elements in set B were inside this other circle denoting set B, then A union B would consist of this entire shaded region where the sets A and B are combined. Meanwhile, A intersection B, which is denoted using this upside down U, is the set of elements X such that X is found in both A and B. Again, if I drew the sets A and B in a Venn diagram, then A intersection B would be the set of elements given by this shaded region that's common to both A and B. However, if set A and B happen to have no common elements, so if the Venn diagram looks something like this, where A and B were completely separate, then A intersection B would be an empty set, which is basically a set that contains nothing. The empty set, by the way, is denoted by the Greek letter phi. Now when A intersection B is empty, then the sets A and B are said to be disjoint. The next operation I'm going to talk about is complement. The complement of a set A, also called A prime, consists of all the elements X that are not in set A. If I were to draw a Venn diagram, for instance, then the complement of set A would then represent the entirety of the shaded region outside set A. Now there's another type of complement, which is the complement of A relative to B, denoted by B backward slash A. What this set means is all the elements in set B that do not belong to set A. Again, the idea here is that in this Venn diagram, the complement of A relative to B would be this shaded region in set B that does not overlap with set A. Now, the union and intersection operations that I just discussed aren't just restricted to two sets. You can also apply them to as many sets as you want. For example, the union of multiple sets, AI, where I is a running index from 1 to N, can be written as the following. And this is going to turn out to be the set of elements that belong to at least one of the sets A sub i, where i varies from 1 to n. On the other hand, the intersection of multiple sets, which is written like this, is the set of elements found in all of the sets A sub i. Keep in mind that you can also take the union or intersection of an infinite number of sets. Anyway, that should do it for the video. It might feel like a definition dump, but we kind of have to go over definitions in the first few videos before we can get to any proofs. In the next lesson, I'm going to introduce functions. I'd like to finish off by thanking the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher, and if you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.